Good evening. On behalf of the president of the Wilkes-Barre NAACP, Camille Caliste, as well as our executive committee, we welcome you to the general membership meeting of the NAACP branch number 2306. Tonight, we are presenting the NAACP Political Action Committee's forum featuring candidates for Luzerne County Common Police Court Judge. The NAACP is very happy to provide this effort as a service to our community. This is just one of the many endeavors the Heritage Branch undertakes every election season. Keep in mind, we have membership open to the public. Let us open this event with a short prayer. We thank you this night for the ability and the opportunity to meet freely and exchange ideas and thoughts. Please guide us as we embark on the decision-making process within the next week. Give us guidance, let Providence bless America and our troops. I'd like to direct your attention to the flag that is going to be up on our screen. It's a virtual flag. And we are going to be um, saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I am joined tonight by Daryl Lewis, Mr. Daryl Lewis, the executive committee member of the branch. And he took a conceptualization of a program and has turned it into the reality of what you're seeing tonight. And so we appreciate the fact that he has done that. Our um, Political Action Committee Director, Bill Brown, is going to be the timekeeper. And so uh, he will be taking care of that. John Barnes from Community Outreach will be our coordinator for the chat, if we get any chat questions that are going to be coming through. And uh, Erica Acosta has been one of the people who has been helping us throughout the, this particular effort. Now, I'd like to go over the ground rules, but before I do that, I'd like to acknowledge the Wilkes-Barre Area League of Women Voters who had their forum last week. Uh, I understand it was well attended and we appreciate the fact that uh, they did that particular forum because it engages people in the community with the candidates. So they did a wonderful job except on YouTube. We're gonna be having our forum up on YouTube as well. And we've invited a couple of members of the league tonight to tune in. Now here are the ground rules. Each candidate will be given 90 seconds to answer a question. When time is called, and if you are in mid-sentence, please finish it. Uh, regarding chat questions, just understand, we want the viewers to understand that we want you to frame the question so that each candidate could answer it. It has to be that way so that each candidate could answer it. Uh, be mindful of the timekeeper's signs. He does not want to intrude on the process. Now, when we first started advertising this event, you might have noticed that all of the candidates were in alphabetical order according to their last names. So um, it was Bobek, Dennis, Kakora Kravitz, Salavantis, and Tuhill. So tonight we're going to change it up a little bit and it's going to be in alphabetical order according to the first names. So it's going to be Alexandra, Jim, Lara, Stephanie, and Tara. Uh, Stephanie and Tara basically are that and clean up, so they're going to be in the same, <laughs> same spots as before. Now, when I was giving the opening prayer, you might have noticed that I said, God bless, God bless our, uh, uh, let Providence bless our troops, God bless our troops. And uh, it goes without saying that anybody who serves in the military, that's probably the most patriotic thing a person could do. But I've always felt that the most second most patriotic thing anybody could do was to actually run for public office. And when you run for public office as a candidate, you not only run by yourselves, but it's the moms and the dads, it's the brothers and the sisters, it's the uncles and the aunts, it's the godparents, it's the kids, it's the families. It's pretty much everybody who runs with you. And I just want to uh, give a shout out to the families 
as well as the people who are running, you guys who are running for this office, because that should be said, um, that should be uh, stated and said that, you know, families also get involved with this particular type of thing. So let's get to it. And we're going to have the candidates um, answer questions. And after briefly introducing yourselves, tell us why voters should support you rather than your opponent. That's our first question. And if we could have uh, Alexander Kravitz do that, that would be great. Great, good evening. Thank you, David, very much. Thank you to the NAACP for hosting tonight's uh, forum. Thank you to uh, the President Khalees, um, as well as your executive committee for putting together um, this forum so everyone can get to know the candidates a little bit better. It's nice to see all of the candidates as well. So, uh, you know, thank you very much for having me. <clears throat> um, Participating in an open forum like this really speaks to the heart of our democracy as, uh, as the United States. So being able to discuss issues in a public and open forum will allow voters to get to know all of the individual candidates a little better. I'm Alexandra Kokora Kravitz. Um, I'm a lifelong resident of Luzerne County. I have two young children. I'm raising my family here. In fact, I live in the house that I grew up in. Um, for the last eight years, I have had the honor of being an elected magisterial district judge in the greater Pittston area. So that's the city of Pittston and all of the surrounding uh, boroughs. And in the last eight years, I've handled over 40,000 cases, ranging from criminal matters, very serious criminal matters, to domestic violence issues, neighbor disputes, landlord tenant matters, um, traffic disputes, uh, on call duties overnight. I've rotated through the Luzerne County Central Court for the last three years, <clears throat> excuse me, and in all of that time, the reason that I, uh, you know, believe and the reason I'm wanting to uh, expand my jurisdiction to the Court of Common Pleas is based on experience. I have the experience of presiding as a neutral arbiter, thousands, if not tens of thousands. Thank you. All right. Uh, next up is uh, Jim Bobek. Thank you very much, everyone. The NAACP, thank you, Dave. Thank you, the executive committee. And, and again, the voters who came. Thank you very much. Just very briefly, by the way, Dave, my uh, brother is serving currently in the military. He's 10 years younger, but for years he's told my father that he should be son number one. Just gave him a little more ammunition on that one. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. But really, with that being said, this is round two of a public job interview. And once again, we look to the voters to be the hiring managers. And I always just like to tell you why it's important. You only get one chance to truly judge the judge, and this is it. And you are ultimately looking for someone who is going to make the decisions that will quite frankly affect your life, whether that's real estate, discrimination, civil rights, zoning, housing, simple criminal matter. The judge is gonna be the person who's gonna be there. This is your one opportunity to make that decision. So thank you for coming, thank you for taking it serious. Candidly, if you, were to, if you were to ask me what differentiates me, candidly, I'm not here to win a race. I'm ultimately here to serve. This is what my career has been, uh, starting as a law clerk, but more importantly than working as a judge for the past 11 years, and then the last 16 years as well, working as an attorney. This, this is what I do. This is the calling. This is the skill that I have. And ultimately, I'd like to put it in play for you, and this is what I want to do. A judge, we cannot make the quality of results. What we can ensure is a quality of opportunity. And it's for that very reason that I wanted to be here, that I want to serve, and thank you very much. Attorney Dennis. You're on mute. I'm not mute. I was muted. I'm sorry. Is it coming through? Now we can hear you. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I'm Laura Dennis. Uh, I am an attorney here in Luzerne County. I have uh, my husband, Dante. He is third generation running his family uh, towing business and garage. I have a 19 year old stepson, Dante Tyler, and a 10 year old daughter, Mia. And I have never run for any political office. I, uh, when you talked about the veterans, whenever I talk about 
my decision to finally run for anything. It would only ever be something in a courtroom. Uh, my uncle, Jack, I, I love to tell the story about how he spent his first wedding anniversary in the jungles of Vietnam, and he crafted a card for my aunt uh, with an ink pen and held on to it and saved it so he could give it to her. And I say, uh, my husband may be on this, but he sometimes can't get to CVS at the corner to get me an anniversary card. So I think about the sacrifice that our, our veterans have made for us. And I would never come to ask for a vote unless I felt I was qualified. I've practiced law for 23 years now. I've been an arbitrator. Uh, at the magistrate level, it's capped off at 14,000 for civil cases. If you uh, then file at common police court, I, I'm one of the people that would hear those cases if they go up to $50,000. I've done that for many, many years. I'm a special master in divorce and I've tried cases. I've been in every single courtroom that you could be in working as an attorney over two decades. Thank you. Okay, Laura, thank you very much. Keep in mind two things about apologies. The only thing you need to apologize for, the only two reasons why you should apologize for anything is love and homicide. So don't worry about it. <laughs> All right. All right. So uh, 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 Stephanie Salavantis, you're next up. Um, I just want to thank the NAACP for um, hosting this. I unfortunately was unable to attend the League of Women Voters Forum because of a scheduling conflict. So I'm very happy to be a part of this forum. And, um, and David, for you moderating this forum, I, I, I thank you so much. And to all of those who are watching and participating tonight, um, it, it means a lot because this is a very important race. Um, to all of the candidates here, I have so much respect for them and it's nice to see you tonight. Um, my name is Stephanie Salavantis and I am running for judge. Um, I do wanna say if you wanna learn a little more about me, uh, you could visit my website at www salivantisforjudge.com um, because I know that we're only going to be able to discuss uh, certain things tonight. So um, you could learn a little more about me, but I do want to tell people that um, a little bit of, uh, about my background. I was born and raised in Luzerne County um, and I live in Kingston Borough and am married and have a newborn baby. Actually, I guess she's not a newborn. She, in two days, she'll be four months old. And as people say, um, time flies. It does. I cannot believe she'll be four months old already. But um, I, I grew up with parents who owned small businesses and uh, parents and a family that were never involved in politics. So um, when I decided to run for office back in 2011 for district attorney, um, my family was sort of, we were surprised that I was willing to jump into politics without having any experience. And um, I did it because I wanted to make a difference. I wanted to be part of the system. And did, did someone say time? Yes, I said time. Oh my gosh, the time goes by so fast. But it thank does. you everybody for having me. And I know I'll be talking about more throughout the forum. Thank you, Representative uh, and Attorney Tuhill. Thank you. Thank you to the NAACP and the chapter president for hosting this forum this evening. It's an honor to be with all of you uh, and to be on the ballot uh, next Tuesday. I want to thank the moderator and, and my colleagues. My name is Tara Tuhill, and I'm asking for your vote so that I can serve all the people of our county as common pleas judge. Racial inequality and injustice are difficult conversations to have with each other and to have with our children. As a judge, my job will be to listen, and I look forward to this conversation this evening as part of that process uh, in court listening and also uh, in our society. In court, as an attorney, I have worked to improve legal count as legal counsel in pro bono cases. I have addressed racial profiling in cases. In the community, I've been a champion for children uh, fighting poverty and homelessness. And in the legislature, I've worked to repair broken laws uh, and improve racial disparities in policing and in the juvenile justice system. And um, as a judge, it will be my job to listen and I will be an unbiased judge. I will be non-presidential, non-prejudicial, uh, and I will be open-minded. Um, I guess you could say non-presidential as well. Uh, and in the role of judge, 
uh, to take testimony and allow both sides to argue, achieve compromise, and when you cannot achieve compromise to make those tough decisions. And I will carry out this role with fidelity, hard work, and integrity. So thank you for having me this evening. Time. All right, our next question will begin with Jim Bobeck and basically following up on everything that the candidates have said. Say you win. How would you staff your office? What would you be looking for in a person to help you in your office? And what experience do you have in setting up an office? Yeah, thanks for that question. Uh, number one, there's a big difference between getting elected and then doing the job. So doing the job, the first thing that you have to do is get a very experienced team around you. And the big thing is when you are a judge, what you're gonna be doing a lot of is writing decisions. So ultimately, I'm going to be looking for some of the brightest, most diverse minds who will help me, to be quite frank, write adjudications, write opinions when they come up. Uh, so when you're in a courtroom and you're the judge, and so doing this for 11 years, you hear a lot of different objections, you're going through a lot of different testimony, but ultimately your clerks, they're the people who are also in the room, your second and third set of eyes, who are going to be able to see a variety of different things that you miss. And they're going to help you out and you're going to talk later on and then they're going to really help you sort through issues so really we're going to be looking for the brightest and most diverse people that can ultimately help me write adjudications and really make sure that i'm seeing everything clearly candidly anyone who tells you as a judge that they do it on their own it's ultimately not true you have people in there that are helping you and that's going to be a big part of my staff and so we're going to do a recruitment of the brightest folks that we possibly can to have as clerks and at the same time, just from a tip staff standpoint, you're going to be looking for people with experience who know how to navigate around the courtroom. And let me say this, we're going to make tons of mistakes and errors, but they're small administrative errors, you know, just where to go. But ultimately, you want to have that team around you, especially when you are a new judge in a new setting. People who have been there know some things about the system. Surround yourself with them. You're going to do a lot better that way. But ultimately, it's still going to start with law clerks, smart I'm good folks. Okay, Laura. Hi. Attorney uh, Dennis. Yes, I've uh, I've been in private practice for for 23 years. I've had my own office. I work as part of a team as a solicitor for a borough, and I work as part of a team for the solicitor uh, part time in the office of law at the county. In addition to that, I have been successful in. Uh, business in the sense that we have uh, properties. So I think that when you're dealing with a lot of different people, that helps you create a team atmosphere. Now, make no mistake, one of the reasons I never ran for judge before is when you're judge, you're on that bench and you are calling a lot of the shots. You don't look to your left, you don't look to your right, you don't ask somebody who's on your staff. You have to know what you're doing. Ultimately, you are responsible. It is your name on the line. That is why I never ran for judge before I started having extensive experience in a courtroom trying cases. Having said all that, I believe that what makes a very good team is somebody around you that doesn't yes you to death. You need people that are comfortable in the atmosphere that you've created an atmosphere where they can talk to you. You cannot have somebody that just nods at everything that you say and agrees with you. People with good personalities, someone with definite more technological experience than I have would be helpful. Um, but th those are the kind of people I want to surround myself with. Good, honest people. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Alvantis? When I became district attorney, the one thing that I did um, when I first took office was I surrounded myself with the individuals who had the most experience that I thought and that carried the same vision that I wanted to see for the office. And so um, moving forward as district attorney, we were a successful office because of the decisions I made surrounding myself with the right people. And I think it's important to say when, as, as the other candidates, candidates have stated already, um, it's going to be the same when you become judge. You need to make sure you're surrounded by the right people, not the people that want to appease you all the time. You want smart individuals who know what they're doing, and that will make your uh, office a successful office. And so I would do what I did as district attorney and make sure that I'm hiring the right people for the job that will help me be a fair and impartial judge and um, administer the law. Uh, Tara Tuhill. 
Thank you so much. Um, staffing, the interview process for me would be a rigorous process. I currently run my legislative office and have carried out the role of being the administrator, uh, the boss and the office manager of the legislative office. Talent is obviously extremely important. Having a team that wants to work overtime with me for the people of the county is extremely important. Um, I am by no means a nine to five uh, person. I, I get up very early in the morning and I work throughout the day and into the night. And I believe that this hard work is um, something that'll be important for the county, it will be an asset to the county. And um, I was able to work as a law clerk out of law school. I was able to write opinions. And as a judge, I will be able to spend a lot of my time uh, listening, holding court, reading briefs, and writing opinions. And that's something that I, I really love and love spending my time doing. I love having been able to write laws in the legislature and um, the number the, the two top items that I'll be looking for is experience in a staff, as well as um, the ability to, uh, the willingness to work hard. Magistrate Thank you. Kikura. Thank you. Um, you know, similarly to Representative Tuhill, I've I manage my current office. I have for the last eight years. Um, you know, when you're a magisterial district judge, you're also in charge of managing the staff um, and ensuring that the offices run efficiently. So I've been fortunate enough to be surrounded by um, very hard workers, people that share a vision of ensuring um, that cases are heard efficiently and processed efficiently um, in a timely manner. That being said, um, as a county court judge, I think we would all have a really really great opportunity to um, recruit, you know, diverse law students um, from diverse backgrounds and law schools to bring into um, the Luzerne County judicial system. I think there's a real great opportunity there. I myself, the first, uh, my first experience in the courtroom was as a free intern law clerk. I called every judge in the book and um, I said, I need, I need to get some hours in, who will help me? And one answered and I, I ended up uh, clerking with them as a full-time job um, after I passed the, the bar exam. So I, I just believe in, in young and, and diverse backgrounds in making sure that we are incorporating everyone into the justice system. There's a real opportunity there for us to do that. So if we can staff ourselves or surround ourselves with people that want to work hard um, and make sure that people's rights are being ensured and that cases are heard efficiently and fairly, then I think we'd all be in a good position. Thank you very much. Um, Attorney Dennis, you and I have been, as well as the other candidates who are on our dais today, uh, virtual dais, know that in every judicial election, uh, a candidate will say that they're tough. I'm gonna be tough. Define tough. Tough uh, to me, well, Dave, you promised me you wouldn't use any really long words today, so. That, that's good. Okay. Um, so tough is a good one, but I think tough is something that happens when you're tested and you only know how you're going to act over circumstances happening to you and what comes out on the other side. I think that in life, you carry with you experiences. And I think everybody's definition of tough is different because of different things that they've had. I, you know, I had a, a client that um, had experiences in life at a very young age, you know, trauma that I could never imagine in my life. But knowing about his experiences are things that I feel are going to help me in my own journey. So being tough is when you're tested. It's about having character that no matter what happens, you have to be have integrity, have character, and hold on to those things because that's what's gonna shape you going forward and then the experience along the way. How you deal with it, how you're able to deal with things, handle them as they come at you. So I think that's what being tough is about. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Salavantis. Uh, to me, tough is um, it, knowing that you have to make difficult decisions, but always um, abiding by what you believe in and doing what is right. Um, as district attorney, I have um, every day had to go into the courthouse and handle um, thousands of cases throughout my time and making these difficult decisions. 
um, and always standing up for and not not uh, and deciding not to um, second guess myself in making those decisions. Um, that is what I believe tough is. You need to stand by those decisions. Um, even if uh, it may not be a popular decision, it may not be something that everybody agrees with, but if you are following the law, following what you believe in, um, it, that is what is important. So I believe that um, it, through my experience as district attorney, I have remained tough, tough on those who have committed crimes in our community, but also remain fair to those who deserve to uh, to de deserve a second chance, deserve to be looked at um, it, it, with empathy. And so um, that is what I truly believe tough is. Um, State Representative Tuho. Thank you, Dave. Uh, I think being tough is making a decision that no one will like, uh, that both attorneys on both sides may leave your courtroom shaking their heads and not being happy with your decision. Tough is looking at all the facts and making decisions. I think you're frozen here for a second here, let me see. I stopped the clock on her. And they're hard to hear. And Okay. Okay, you stopped the clock, good. Okay. Um, you're frozen of Tad here, so let's just see what's happening with this. Um, I don't know where you lost me at, but um, you know, it. it's, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. So uh, tough is two things. Um, tough is the ability to make decisions that no one is going to like. And then secondly, um, the realm of family law and uh, the evidence that you hear, the photographs that you see, uh, and, and the testimony that you listen to is, is very difficult. You deal with abuse cases. You deal with uh, hardships that families have been through. Um, and I am dedicated and uh, compassionate and have dealt for a long time with those issues. And um, it's a tough area, but it's something that I think um, is, is obviously necessary. And that's why I am uh, very interested in being uh, a judge for Luzerne County. Okay, thank you. And sorry for that little glitch there. Um, uh, Alexandra Kokora Kravitz, next. Thank you, David. <clears throat> you know, being tough can mean a variety of things. Um, I can tell you from my experience in the last eight years, um, in my courtroom, uh, handling over 40,000 cases, tough means a series of things. Um, it can mean managing a very busy courtroom. Um, we always don't we don't always deal with um, easy issues. In fact, we deal with very difficult issues most often. Anytime anyone is coming before the court, they're coming as an adversary. It's adversarial by nature. So we have to make tough decisions, tough decisions in the sense that not everybody will be pleased with their decision, but tough means that everyone is being treated fairly, that there's an even playing field when you walk in the door, that people may not be happy with the decision that you're making, but you made it within the parameters of the law in a fair and just manner, and everybody was treated with dignity and respect. And if they were, then they should walk out of your courtroom feeling that they were treated fairly. Now, tough can also mean when you're dealing with people that have substance abuse issues. I've dealt with people that sometimes are currently under the influence. Um, you have to manage a busy courtroom. You have to maintain decorum. You also have to ensure the decorum of the system, um, but also that everyone is being treated fairly and that um, there's a respect level and a dignity level for everyone. Thank you, Attorney Bobek. Thank you. I think when people use the word tough as in tough judge, that word alone means absolutely nothing. So let's take it in a criminal context. People really usually equate tough judge with sentencing. The biggest thing about sentencing, especially in a criminal capacity, is you have to separate bad actors from bad action. Everyone makes a bad mistake. That happens. Bad actors are people who actually harm other people. You can be tough in sentencing on bad actors, people who harm others. But let's take the, the drug addict example. 
you come in front of someone, they haven't harmed anyone other than themselves, and they clearly have a drug addiction. Being a tough judge, and if that means throwing the book at them and putting them in jail, I don't think that makes you tough at all. I think that makes you weak. I think you haven't actually addressed what the real problem is. Being tough is really being able to separate bad actors from bad judgment. And there's a big difference. And that's the biggest thing with the judge. And that's going to take temperance and moderation. And to be quite frank, it's taken me 11 years to build that muscle up. But let's even take it into a civil capacity. Attorneys want a tough judge, but what they really want is a judge when he makes sentencing and when he puts out orders, briefs, this is how I want things on a schedule, that he means what he says or she means what he says and that they'll do it. They do not want people who are simply gaming the system, constantly looking for delays because their clients' lives are at stake. So a tough judge also has to be able to move cases along, and he will do that with timely ways to do it. He's not just going to sit there and let people game it, because he has to remember, the most important case every single time is the one before you. That's what a real tough judge does. Thank you. Thank you. That just kind of leads... Uh, Thank you, Bill. That just kind of leads into the next question that I have. Uh, some communities have done a cashless bail and it's like a bill review program that would allow judges to defer house arrest. Uh, what are your feelings about, uh, and we'll, we'll start with the, uh, Ms. Alavantis about this, about cashless bail. Is that a possibility here? I, I believe that there have been many studies that are being conducted right now with regard to cash bail. Um, and I, I would defer to what they determine if I was elected judge um, to decide based on their, um, their research and studies on whether or not cash bail is something that works. Um, I believe the system is imperfect and I would be open to discussing positive changes when it came to cash bail um, being implemented. Um, however, I, I hesitate saying that it, I apologize as someone's outside, you can hear my dogs. Um, I hesitate uh, saying that it should be eliminated completely because when you have people that reoffend, we don't want them back on the streets immediately um, causing harm to our communities. So we have to look at it and, and really do our research and figure out what is best for our communities, what's best for all participants in the criminal justice system. Um, and um, and it, it, you go, you don't have to go far when you look at some of these um, examples of using cash bail or um, certain types of bail situations. Look at Philadelphia and Chicago. The last thing we want is to um, see our communities harmed by gun violence that's going on. People that are are immediately going out and reoffending in our communities, and you have the police chiefs coming forward and saying that there are a lot of problems and we need to reexamine. So I defer to those who want to do the research and provide us guidance as judges. All right, thank you. Representative Shuho. Thank you so much. Um, cash bail is something that uh, I know Philadelphia worked extremely hard on. Uh, they had cases where nonviolent offenders uh, were being held for six months, nine months, um, and they were low level uh, nonviolent offenders who just simply could not afford to pay bail. Uh, many of them were of African American descent um, and, you know, were, were black and brown individuals in Philadelphia. And I, um, I know recently I, I watched a documentary where uh, there was a group that was going around and even just paying the bail uh, to get those individuals out. And because of poverty, they would not have the chance to be out if their parents can't. Um, Put, put their home up as collateral um, and a judge is unwilling to release them ROR, um, then they would not have that ability. So I know that there's been inroads with this in Philadelphia. I think that some of them are positive. And um, as a judge dealing with criminal court, I know um, I've seen many judges set release on your own recognizance, um, which is a lot like, um, eliminating cash bail uh, because you're not uh, making someone put up cash as collateral. So I, I think it is something that judges are uh, within their ability to do, uh, but there would have to be a legislative change um, in the county as well. Thank you. All right, I'm Magistrate Kakura Kravitz, your take on this. 
it's a very, very important issue. Um, it affects courts across the Commonwealth. Most recently, in July of 2020, uh, the Supreme Court made a ruling that the assignment of cash bail in Pennsylvania must be in accordance with the state law, um, and that applies across the Commonwealth for all of the courts, magisterial district courts, common pleas courts. The court also um, asked that the state court administrator, as well as the criminal rules committee, the criminal rules uh, procedure committee, um, consider ordering reforms. So that is currently being looked at. And that's a really important issue for all of our communities. Um, you know, as a magisterial district judge and hopefully a court of common pleas uh, level, we would have a real opportunity to implement, um, you know, different kinds of measures pre-trial risk assessment tools uh, mm -hmm. with respect to bail, um, to be mindful and expand um, you know, early bail reviews so that people are not sitting in jail uh, waiting for preliminary hearings. Get them in court as, as quickly as we can or have them reviewed as quickly as we can. You know, let me just say this, and I say it every single time I arraign a criminal defendant, bail is not punitive. It should never be punitive. That is not the point. The point is to ensure the appearance of, of criminal defendants um, along with the other series of criteria that we all have to review. But it's a really important topic. Thank you very much for bringing up uh, the question. Uh, Attorney Bobek. So just really briefly, just for everyone who doesn't understand what cash bail is, cash bail is still a legal avenue that is allowed for a defendant to pay to, as just stated, to secure that they are going to show up for their trial dates. Now the question was, what do you think of cash bail? Right now in Pennsylvania, there is a legislative movement on cash bail, whether or not that will go be allowed going forward. Truthfully, as a judicial candidate, we cannot make any comment on whether or not that is a fruitful or meritable legislation. We go beyond our bounds and we say that. So I tell people this, when it comes to cash bail, cash bail is still a last resort for me in my courtroom. It is an option because legally it has to be an option. I cannot say I would remove cash bail because I would be violating the current Pennsylvania law. The cash bill would be a last option for me once you have gone through all the other ways to try to secure someone's presence. And I think it's a really important thing just to remember, the whole purpose of bail is to quite frankly, make sure people who are flight risks do not fly away. And so therefore we'll look at all measures possible. Cash bail will be a last resort in my courtroom. Thank you. Attorney Dennis. Hey, when you asked your question, you also asked about cash less bail, right? Right, exactly. Okay, I just want to make sure. So I, I'm, a, I'm a defense attorney and I've been one for over 20 years. And I am very happy to talk about this because the reform that's needed in this area is long, long overdue. If you believe in this state that two people can get charged for the exact same crime, and if you have the economic status to get yourself out of jail with cash bail, you can do it. And somebody who's poor for the exact same crime cannot get themselves out of jail, and you think that that is free, or you think that that's fair, then you do not believe there needs to be any reform. I believe there needs to be reform. I don't think anybody should not be out of jail because they can't afford to be out of jail. And somebody who has more money than them gets to get out. It's, it's not fair. I believe that, and, and as an attorney, when bail gets set at the entry level courts, we then are allowed to appeal to common police courts to have that adjusted. It's, it doesn't mean it's a I don't believe in violating the community. I don't believe putting the community at risk. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying if you have a bail situation and there's an option for cashless bail, meaning you could be on house arrest and that would protect the community and secure you coming back to court, I 100% think that that's an avenue we need to explore. Thank you. Uh, did everybody understand that I said cashless bail? Is everybody okay with the comment that they made? Okay, you're, I, I'm, I'm here. If I can, I, and I apologize, I'm glad you said that, Laura, because I did not hear cash list. Yeah. I, I agree with the comments that were being made. Um, I think that we should be looking at different avenues instead of putting people in prison, um, it, holding them because they can't afford to uh, pay to uh, get bailed out. So we need to find different avenues like house arrest, like different, uh, uh, different alternatives that we can lean on instead of always considering or looking at putting people in jail if they can't afford it. So I apologize again. Thank you, Laura, for pointing that out. I did not realize that you said cashless bail. 
Anybody else want to weigh in? No, I think Attorney Dennis spoke very eloquently about exactly okay. what cashless bail would be. Where you're not a flight risk, cashless bail is always going to be the best choice, and it's the best thing for the system. Right. Jimmy's you. always a gentleman. I just want to say that. All righty. Um, again, I just wanted to double check and make sure everybody was okay with that. Jim actually made a point about the legislature, about state law. So to what extent do you believe that a judge should or should not defer to the actions of the legislature? Would there ever be a situation where there would be a legislative law that was set up and then all of a sudden, you know, you have to make a decision on it or would you make a decision on it? And so uh, let's see, we end it with um, Laura, correct? And so that would be uh, Ms. Alavantis. I actually think I started the last time. Okay, you did so, were, okay. Yeah, if yeah. you want me to start, I- No, no, I that's okay, that's okay. Uh, that Ms. Tuville, sorry, sorry about that. Nope. Okay, Thanks. so yes, it's, it's me, um, thank you. So that's pretty appropriate um, considering I'm in the legislature currently. Uh, so if, there's, I mean, there's a difference between a legislative movement, um, say there could be a legislative movement to eliminate cash bail. Um, uh, uh, there could be a, I mean, obviously there's always a legislative movement in some direction, one direction um, or another, but as a judge, you have to go by the law and what the current law is. So um, the, any kind of, political wind or movement that's trying to move through the House or the Senate, um, it would be inappropriate to take into consideration. Um, so I, I think the answer, I mean, my answer would be no, the, the judge has to look at uh, the case law that is controlling as well as the current laws uh, before you and apply the law and uphold the law. All right. Um and uh, it would be Alexander Kakora Corbett next. It's a long name, David, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I think uh, the separation of powers is what makes, uh, you know, the United States the United States. As a member of the judiciary, as a current member of the judiciary, um, you know, judges stay in their lanes. That's our job. We are not meant to legislate from the bench. Um, that's not to be said that we're not mindful about, about what our legis legislatures are doing. I mean, we certainly should be, but we need to apply the law, the current law in a fair and impartial manner. That's the job of the judge. And judges aren't advocates, but judges are resources. Courts are resources for people. Um, and that extends to everything that talks about, you know, some, what we just talked about with, with maybe a cashless bail issue um, that extends into opportunities for expansion of substance abuse disorder um, treatment programs and mental health treatment programs and juvenile justice improvement programs. Um, all of those kinds of things uh, have developed over the last 20 years or so for courts to expand, to take an individualized approach for people that are coming before the courts. But we must operate and we should always operate within the purview and the parameters of the law. That's our job. That's what judges do. Um, and that's what we should continue to do, uh, but be mindful of, of what's happening in the other branches of government. Thank you, Jim Bobek. Uh, Dave, I just wanna make sure I understand the context of the question. Are we stating that as a judge, if a bad legislation comes before us involving a case, what would we do? Or is the context a little bit different there? No, it's basically to, to what extent would you believe that a judge should or should not defer to the actions of the legislature? I mean, you know, it would if, if it would be something that would be mandated state law and you would have to enforce it. And that's, that's where we're coming from with that. Thank you. Ultimately, all, all judges have to defer to the state law. And by that, I mean this, we are not legislators. I spent five years, I mean, when I talk about writing county laws, writing county laws, and you do the very best that you can when you're writing and you do with the best intent. But when you move into that role as a judge, I'm doing this for 11 years now, whether it's a good law, or a bad law, you have to enforce the law as it is, not as you wish, and it's gonna have outcomes that you don't like, but you have to enforce the law as it is. Now, a lot of people hear that and they get sad. The courts are ultimately not your avenue to get rid of bad legislation. If it's unconstitutional, that's a different matter, and by the way, that would be in federal court that most likely wouldn't even be before us. 
But if it's a bad law that's before us, we have to enforce the law that we have. Doesn't mean that you're done because a lot of people forget this. When you are a judge and you see the outcomes, they're not always good. Many sides don't like it either way, but that's not the end. The law is a circle. You take those results, you move them to your legislation, and then they can make those changes that are necessary and that you want, to, want them to happen. That's really what should happen. There should be a feedback, feedback mechanism loop. It's not the end, but it's not to correct bad legislation. We have to follow it. We have to look to the intent of what the legislature wanted to do. That's ultimately what we have to do, and that's our, that's our duty here. Attorney Dennis. As a trial attorney, um, I'm in court a lot. Sometimes I'm in different courtrooms five days a week, practicing every single type of law. One thing is when I go into a courtroom and I prepared my client, it's based on the law as it is written. Now, as a judge, we're all looking at the same, at the same law, but there are two sides going into those cases. So the interpretation from the legislature is something that we as judges would give our opinion on. We're not rewriting the law, we're interpreting the law as they have written it, what it means. Sometimes it's very clear what the law means and we are relying on that. Sometimes there's room for interpretation in the law. If you open any legislative book, you're gonna see citations of cases below it where they have further defined elements of the law. It doesn't change it, it's just their definitions, their interpretation of what that law is. As someone who's practiced law for a very long time, that's something that I've done a lot of. So being able to read a law, interpret, and then that's why, you know, you, when you have two sides in a case, um, you read what they have, you, you have briefs, you have motions, you have legal documents that, um, that you make your decision on based on what the, the written law is and, you, and your um, decision-making skills from being able to interpret everything from both sides, but we have to rely on the law as it is written. We cannot change that. We cannot change that law. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Salavantis. You know, as district attorney, I was able to um, work with the legislature. And when I saw that there were issues with the laws that we were, um, we were um, administering, I, I was able to reach out to the legislator and make changes. One positive change that um, I was instrumental in working with the legislators on was closing a DUI loophole called Kevin's Law. Um, those were positive things that I was able to do as DA, but at, as a judge, as everybody else stated, you are not you you are not to legislate from the bench. You are not to um, determine uh, what law is a good law to follow or not. Um, you are to follow the laws that um, you have in front of you. And um, as was stated, there may be times that you um, have to interpret the law based on arguments that are presented to you. But ultimately, you are to abide by what the law is, what the state law is, and not legislate from the bench. Thank you very much. I uh, reminded that this is the NAACP Wilkesbury Branch 2306 Zoom meeting. Meet the candidates, the candidates for Luzerne County Court of Common Pleas. Um, this program is being recorded. And uh, do we have any chat questions at all? John? Yes, we do. Uh, the first one is as a judge, what can you do to ensure that a public defender is spending, with, is spending an adequate amount of time with his or her client? Okay, so that we, we would start with Alexandra Kokora Kravitz. That's a great, that's a great question. Thank you to um, uh, whoever asked that question. Um, as a judge, we really do have an obligation to ensure that people are represented fairly, um, and with enough adequate time to prepare their cases. I deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis. And this year has been challenging like no other. Um, we were forced to shut down because of the pandemic, yet, you know, yet we had an obligation to defendants to make sure that their rights were being heard and processed fairly and efficiently in the criminal justice system. I have routinely appointed public defenders on cases. Um, I do it all the time. And the reason I do that is to make, well, obviously there's an obligation and each criminal defendant is entitled to representation, but to ensure that they are, are being met in a, uh, 
in a timely manner, I think we have room to improve on that. Um, and that would be, you know, the courts working through the public defender's office, as well as the district attorney's office working together to make sure that clients are being met um, uh, in a timely basis with their public defender. It was very difficult this year. I, you know, I know that they had to adapt to doing things uh, through Zoom, telephone, um, you know, I routinely call the public defender's office to make sure um, that that if they needed time to meet with their clients ahead of time, that we're doing that um, so that, you know, the cases are being heard timely. But it's a great question because, uh, you know, public defenders need time to meet with their clients and clients absolutely um, have a right to meet with their public defenders for as long as they need to. Thank you. Attorney Bobek. So in law school, I used to spend my summers, I worked in the Philadelphia Public Defender's Office and then also the Montgomery County, uh, which are two of the biggest high, high prolific areas for public defenders. The answer to this is actually really easy and it does not necessarily lie with the judicial branch. The answer is resources. You would talk to any public defender out there, they will just tell you that they have limited resources and therefore they have limited time for their clients, literally preparing right before the hearing. The easiest answer to this is actually giving them more resources. Pennsylvania is a very unique state. Most states actually fund their public defenders. Pennsylvania does not. It leaves it up to the county. So every year with Luzerne County, we have our budget fight. And that budget fight for public defenders is giving enough resources. Because what that really means is when they have enough resources, they can then have enough time to focus on their clients. They don't have to have an unnecessarily high amount of clients that they can never give proper time to. Because you don't want to be a public defender, and at best, you are just providing uh, minimal coverage. The only thing you can actually do as a judge, ultimately, at this point, is seeing these clients, recognizing when the attorney has not prepared at all and just cannot get there, giving that person time to be prepared. That is the one thing we can only do as a judge, or remove them if we don't think they're doing a good job. But the answer is always going to be resources resources that they can actually focus on their cases. And that's a county funding issue along with the state issue. And that requires a bigger, bigger collaborative effort to make sure that- All right, All right thank you. Attorney Dennis. So I, as uh, I, for many years, I worked as a conflict attorney and that means if there's uh, a reason that someone can't get a public defender, they could get an attorney that's a conflict attorney in the conflict office. Um, the public defenders in Luzerne County are, to me, unsung heroes. They, the caseloads that they have are, are tremendous. They are extremely seasoned trial attorneys, every single one of them. They have a lot of courtroom experience. Now, once you move at the magistrate level, that's your, your probable cause case. That's a 50-50 balance on a criminal case. If it just tips a little bit, it gets moved forward to common police court. That's when the extensive trial work gets done. When someone enters a plea in common pleas court, there's a guilty plea colloquy. That's a series of questions that the judge asks the defendant. As part of the series of those questions is, are you satisfied with your attorney? Have they explained the elements to you? Do you understand what those, uh, what your sentencing is going to be? It's a multi-page document that's gone over. Um, so that, that ensures one of the ways that the judge could know whether or not they're happy with their with their clients or with their if the clients are happy with the attorneys so as judges we would need to make sure that that procedure is followed and then you know again it's open forum the discussions with the clients making sure that they are represented i was in C columbia county this morning there were 238 people on uh -huh. the call the list thanks all right uh, uh, district attorney former district attorney salamantis and I, I'm very happy that this question was asked because this is something that I have worked very closely on as district attorney with the chief public defender of Luzerne County um, and, and discussing this with the courts and with um, our county council, um, making sure that our offices are properly funded. And I know we talked about public defenders, but um, both offices, when they work well together and are able to be very prepared for their cases, the, the system works more efficiently and effectively. And that's why um, Chief Public Defender Steve Greenwald and I would work hand in hand trying to explain to the public, to the county council, how resources are necessary to make sure we have enough attorneys that can handle these cases. I know for a fact that um, these attorneys are handling 
hundreds of cases at one given time. And so how do you expect them to be able to have the time to go and see and adequate, adequately prepare for these cases when they have so many other cases that they have to do the same thing for. So uh, to me, it's all about making sure that we have enough lawyers that can actually go and meet with their clients and be prepared. As a judge, and if I saw that as, as a judge overseeing um, some of the cases and seeing that certain clients um, weren't, are not adequate, adequately being represented because of that fact, I would um, call out that attorney and find out what the issues are because that should not be happening. Everyone has a right to adequate, good representation. And we have some great public defenders, um, great conflict counsel that should be respected in that way. Thank you. Um, Representative Attorney Tuhill. David, uh, a judge needs to identify where uh, these situations exist, where um, a client needs extra time with counsel for conversations or to have questions answered. As an attorney, I've worked in uh, pro bono cases uh, for juveniles in Luzerne County and the, in the surrounding counties um, where families are unable to uh, feel confident in their counsel um, or have questions that need to be answered and need extra time. Um, and, and really that's the duty. It is a duty of the attorneys um, to inform their clients of their rights, listen to their clients and make sure your client knows what they're facing at each stage. Uh, and it's very important that these attorneys uphold their duties. Um, and as a judge, um, you know, watching what's going on in your courtroom, I think sometimes there's glaring inadequacies and, and sometimes it is because um, of uh, defense counsel being overloaded and not having time. Uh, uh, there are obviously budgetary issues that have been referenced uh, by the district attorney, um, by, by Stephanie Salavantis. She just referenced those and that's more of a a county council and a, a legislative resource issue. Um, but I think that allowing extra time is one of the big items and, and making sure um, that the uh, defendant before you is confident in their counsel and their questions are answered right. is an important role of the judge. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, John, do we have another question? Yes. What are your views on whether the court as a whole deals effectively with racial and gender bias issues? All right, so Attorney Bobek, you would be up next with that. I just want to make sure I understand the question. The question was, how does the court do with racial and gender biases? Correct. And what are your views on whether the court as a whole deals effectively with racial and gender bias issues. Thank you. So let me take that last part first. Ultimately, I think your court system is, I've said this before, it's really a reflection of what America is, which means there is gender bias. There is racial inequality. There's no doubt about this. And ultimately then when you as the judge come before us, you'll notice none of the laws actually have it. It's the enforcement and then the interpretation of those laws. And I said this earlier, there will be gender bias in anything. It actually could be written right into the legislation as well. Same thing with racial bias. It can be written right into the legislation. When you have it as a judge, ultimately the biggest thing that you can make sure that our one and only job, ensure equality of opportunity, ensure equality that everyone gets a fair shake. And it does not matter if you are male, it doesn't matter if you're female, it does not matter that your race, your creed, your color. That's the one thing that we can make sure that we are enforcing. So ultimately, it may be there, but as a judge, that's one of the major reasons I'm running, is I think we all feel like this, no matter who we are, that it's not equal opportunity, that sometimes there are not the right results because somebody knew somebody or they had an in with the system. But one thing, the only thing I can promise as a judge is that you will get a fair shake, and that's it, that you will get that equality of opportunity, it doesn't matter what you are, that you will get that chance to make your case heard. Thank you. Attorney Dennis. Well, when you're talking about the court as a whole, I don't know, um, you know, beyond the bench, how, how far we'd like to talk about. But I mean, when, when you have 14% uh, of the population being made up of African-Americans and 34% of the prison population being made up of African-Americans, 
there's a disparity going on somewhere. So I would have to say, and you know, gender, I want to talk about socioeconomic. You go into a courtroom, you can almost draw a line sometimes between where the people who are disparaged economically sit and where the people who are not disparaged economically sit. So as a court and as a judge, one thing I have talked about since the minute that I uh, announced was that I think we need, I mean, following the law is the law. But that's certainly one part of it. Everybody needs to be treated exactly equal. Now, once you're in the system, now what's going to happen? Um, you know, I was proud of my work as a conflict attorney, uh, working with juveniles for three years. Um, but we need to expand treatment courts. They need to be, there's a mental health crisis in this country. Um, we need to talk about drug treatment courts. Of course, uh, I'd love to see an expansion for veterans, but we need to recognize where people in the system can be helped so that we don't have higher recidivism rates, so that we keep people and help them in the time that we have them. If that's the job we could do as a judge to help them, first being fair and then helping them long-term for when they're back in the community. Awesome. All right, uh, District Attorney uh, Salavantis. I do believe that uh, gender inequality and um, and racial uh, gender bias and racial inequality does exist. I do I do believe it does exist. Um, however, I I don't know um, as a judge. I believe that you you need to be fair and impartial, and you need to look at the case that comes before you and identify what you could do as a judge for that individual case itself. Yeah. Um, I, I believe that that more education is needed in this area. Um, we need to talk about it more and um, and determine how we can better address these issues. But as a judge sitting on the bench, um, I do believe that uh, that we can be uh, that person that can, if we see it happening, that we can correct. Um, any inequalities that are taking place. Um, and, I, and I also agree with uh, uh, Laura Dennis that when you're looking at these individuals, um, you need to look at the total picture and how you can assist them individually um, with the issues that, that may be taking place in their lives. Um, no matter what race, what gender, what background you come from, socioeconomic background, we need to be looking at those individuals and saying, how can we help them and um, look at diversion programs? We, uh, during my time as district attorney, I did expand all diversion programs, including creating different diversion programs, especially for our youth, um, that we were seeing increases of inequality, it, 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 minorities coming through. Thank you. Um, Attorney Representative Tuhill. Thank you. I have witnessed racial bias firsthand. My sister is African American, and I actually discussed this event before coming here tonight or coming on Zoom with you tonight because it's very important um, to listen and to constantly educate yourself. Um, I've also experienced racial bias in my son's life. My son is African American, so I know that it exists. Having a son who is African American makes me particularly sensitive uh, and very aware of statistics and racial bias. I feel that, that a lot of mothers who have children that are Latino or African American are fearful that their child will be treated differently um, in the community, by law enforcement, and by the court system. A lot that happens is at the front door. So it's before you ever get to the courtroom. Um, a, a lot of, um, you know, driving while black, being wrongfully accused, being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, my deepest fear is that my son uh, will be prejudged because of the color of his skin or that there will be bias that impacts his life and that it will even impact his safety as he grows older and that he would be harmed in a, in a situation. So um, I, I'm very, I have a, a very, um, a lot of emotion, I guess, for me on, on that topic of racial bias and a lot of compassion. And um, I think that uh, um, I, I can tell you in my courtroom, there will not be racial bias or gender bias in my courtroom. Magistrate Alexandra Kokora Kravitz, next. Great, thank you. And thank you very much for this important question. Um, <clears throat> yes, racial and gender bias exists. Uh, 
there has been racial injustice and inequity in our courts um, through a variety of ways. But, um, you know, we have an opportunity to end racial disparities at all levels, um, especially in the court system. Uh, and and does, does the court system deal effectively with that? There's room for education um, amongst everyone, whether that be law clerks, lawyers, administration, judges. Um, you know, as a magisterial district judge, um, I've been fortunate enough and required also um, to attend continuing education every single year. Um, and part of that is training and education on understanding both implicit um, biases that come before the court. Uh, this is some, you know, you can never be educated enough. Um, we are always learning. We are always um, trying to understand and better um, apply the law in a fair way. Uh, but what I can tell you is that for the last eight years, um, and in the tens of thousands of cases that I've, I've handled, um, I have treated everyone in a fair and impartial manner, everyone on the same playing field. Um, you know, uh, in terms of racial and gender bias, though, I do think that, uh, you know, we have room to educate and, and continue to grow in that area. All right, thank you. John, do we have another chat question? Yes. If you become aware of unethical conduct on the part of a trial advocate in a case in which you were presiding, how would you handle it? Do you believe judges should be required to report attorney misconduct? And so we will start with attorney Dennis. We, we are required to report that. Um, there are, uh, we have a disciplinary bar in the, uh, in our state, that monitors the attorneys and we have a board for the judges as well. So as part of your oath, you are required to uphold certain ethical standards. And that includes if you are aware of other um, instances. Now they didn't get into the specifics of, of in this, that question, but I will say that we have programs as attorneys for people that are suffering with substance abuse you know, if someone would come in and, have, you know, be under the influence or have alcohol, we have something called Lawyers Concerned for Lawyers. So there are programs where we can help other attorneys um, who may be suffering uh, from, from different matters. But as far as an actual violation of our code of ethics, that has to, that would have to be uh, reported as part of our, as part of our uh, obligations as attorneys. Ms. Alavantis. I, I, as uh, Attorney Dennis stated, yes, it is an obligation of ours if we find that there was unethical um, conduct being conducted by an attorney, that they should be reported. Um, I, it, I was um, appointed by the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania to a fund um, that's called Pennsylvania Fund for Client Security. And um, I chose and wanted to be a part of that fund because that fund is, um, is set up for those who are, um, are really victimized by lawyers um, that, that have taken from clients and um, they will never be compensated for what they have done to them. And so I became a part of and was appointed to this fund because it reinstituted integrity in, into the legal system, into what lawyers stand for. And um, I felt very strongly about being on that because lawyers, we need to make sure that we are following um, our code of ethics. And we, if we are not, we are harming our profession. And we don't want people to be looking down on the legal profession, on the bar itself. And so um, I do believe it's important to hold people responsible for their actions and make sure that people are being represented to the best of uh, their abilities and um, that as a judge, we need to treat everybody fairly and make sure that um, that we are uh, protecting our community as well. State Representative Tuho. Thank you. Um, yes, as a judge, you um, have to follow the judicial canons and there is a judicial conduct board, um, which you can report um, other judges to, as well as the disciplinary board uh, with the state of Pennsylvania that deals with the licensing of attorneys. So if there is an attorney uh, that would come into your court that you believe they are in violation of 
um, the attorney conduct code um, or um, any ethical violation, you would have to report that and that would be reported um, from my courtroom as well. Thank you. Okay, and um, Alexandra Kokorik Preps. Thank you. Um, yes, I agree. I, I think the rules are clear. Um, any kind of misconduct ought to be reported. And the reason it ought to be reported is not only you know, based on the rules of judicial conduct, um, but it's our obligation to also set an example. Um, you know, as a judge, uh, if something's coming in front of you that you, you see is, is not right or there's some kind of unethical behavior, and um, to Attorney Dennis's point, you know, that, that could also be an underlying substance abuse issue. There's resources for that. But we're judges, and we need to set an example to make sure that um, all ethical standards are being upheld you know, in the courtroom as well as outside of the courtroom. So yes, all of that is reportable um, and it should be. And I think that as judges, we have an obligation um, above reproach to make sure that everyone appearing in our courtroom is under the obligation of all of the rules. Attorney Bobek. Just to even go beyond this, listen, we're not just trying to be judges here or we're not just running for this position or we're just, just attorneys. We have to do it because that's the standard. Look, first and foremost, we're citizens of this country. We're citizens of Luzerne County. It is the right thing to do to report anything, anywhere that you see is wrong, whether that's in the judicial system or outside. And particularly when as a judge, one of the things that you might wonder is, you know, well, okay, what about another judge? Everybody wants to be friendly. Ultimately, I'm running for this position to be independent where you are going to report anything that you see. And we're not talking about disagreements. Everyone has disagreements. We're talking about unethical conduct, that will be reported. And it doesn't matter if you're the judge, it doesn't matter if you're the uh, most expensive attorney out there that everyone just thinks is fantastic, it does not matter. That standard applies to us all. And again, that's not just being an attorney that we're going to do that. You just do it as a basic citizen. You see something, you say something. Because if you don't say something, then you're, just, you're still part of the problem. And you're just another person who whitewashes it and you move right along report it. It goes to an agency whose job will be to look into it. That's our job. That's a, that's a basic fundamental of what we have to do as people. So yes. Thank you, John. Another question? Uh, that's all for now, David. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, you are running a grueling campaign. And what are your thoughts on merit selection of judges? And do you think your great your grandchildren might live to see the day when that happens. Uh, Stephanie Salavantis, you're the person who's gonna be up next on this particular question. I'm sorry, Dave, can you repeat that? Sure, you're it running a grueling way. campaign, right? What are your thoughts on merit selection of judges? I think that we should be looking at the judges and deciding on um, deciding what is uh, what experience these individuals have and uh, making an informed decision as to um, as to uh, the background of each individual who's running and deciding if merit-based, based on the merits of that individual, if that is the person that we should be voting for. Um, I agree with it. I think that um, as uh, myself, I've had, um, I've had nine plus years as district attorney with experience in handling over 45,000 cases, um, overseeing 45,000 cases, making tough decisions every day. On top of prior to being district attorney, I was a civil attorney and handled family law cases. And I have a very diverse background. So I, I would want people to look at my experiences, my accomplishments and my record and make that decision, decide for themselves and what um, what they think um, is the right judge for them. Because as I believe you stated, um, we're going to have, our kids are going possibly going to see these judges on the bench when they're in their 20s. And um, it's an interesting point to, to present because um, you have these judges that will be making decisions for say 20, 30 plus years. So we need to make sure we're making informed decisions and going out and voting on uh, May 18th. Um, so to clarify, so to clarify, you, you're basically saying the system that's in place right now where you're running for office is a system that you'd like rather than 
a judicial board, maybe say in Harrisburg, picking the judge, correct? You're, you're correct. You're, okay, great. Correct. Um, attorney uh, Tuhill, thoughts on this? Just to interject. So just to interject, I believe that um, the way that attorney Salavantis answered it um, was correct because she was speaking generally right. as to merit. Um, but I believe that, I mean, we could sidebar for a second, all of us, but I believe that since it's like typical merit selection, like the house, the piece of legislation that's going through the Senate and the house about merit selection, I believe that we would all have to refrain from discussing that as judicial candidates. So I think Stephanie handled it appropriately, but the question itself, it's, it's my opinion that we would just refrain from talking about actual merit selection and that legislative initiative, because that would be more of a, um, a an opinion like a on a that would be asking for more than like what our platform allows as a judicial candidate. On something yeah, and, that might be coming before us. Does everybody agree with that assessment from Attorney Tuhill? Yes. Yes, and that that is why generally I you did I, I great to though with that. that I was way. Like, yeah, that. <laughs> Is everybody okay with that? Does anybody else want to weigh in on this question? Well, ultimately, whether you do merit-based selection or do we have it right now where the voters make that choice, that is ultimately a decision yeah. of the Pennsylvania legislation. So they, that is ultimately in their purview. And listen, there are pros and cons to both of these. Uh, right now, the system that we have is not merit-based. Your federal system is merit-based. Your current Pennsylvania system is not merit-based. So therefore, it is up to the voters to do their homework. That's how the legislator has it right now. It's their job to do their homework who they want to be their judge. And that's the way the system is right now. And so ultimately, even as candidates, yes, that is the system that we have to follow. That's why we're here. It does make judicial elections very expensive. These are, we talked about gender bias and racial bias. There's a socioeconomic bias just in running our races right now. They're expensive. These are very expensive to do. It does not mean everyone can do it, but that is the system that we have. And ultimately, if you want to be a judge, you have to be willing to go forward on that and play within the system that we have. And the reason why I asked the question, because at one time there was merit selection in Luzerne County for judges prior to judges being elected. Um, okay, uh, the next um, uh, question we're going to ask, and basically the final question we're going to ask is going to be uh, starting with Representative Tuhill. And basically, who is or was your judicial role model? So we touched upon this uh, in our last um, debate. We got to talk about it a little, and it was really interesting to hear everyone's answers. Um, and I would have to say, so we, we talked about from the Supreme Court with Sandra Day O'Connor. I, I had mentioned um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And I really liked how um, Alec, Judge Kravitz, how you had brought it down to the local level. And I had talked about um, working as a law clerk. And I do have to mention um, Judge Burke, who is retired. Um, he is a phenomenal, even-minded, uh, very conscientious, prudent, hardworking, hardworking um, judge. And so he's nearing retirement. Uh, but he was someone that always had an open door for me um, as a young lawyer coming in, he would listen to me. Um, I, I got to see him in the courtroom and I really felt remiss when we left our conversation in the last debate that I hadn't mentioned him um, because I think he probably had a, an impact on many of us. And he is someone that I um, strive to be like uh, as a judge um, if I'm given that opportunity by the voters. So I would say um, Judge Burke, he was the president judge at one point in Luzerne County, um, and he is nearing retirement and his seat is going to be one of the seats that uh, my colleagues here and I are seeking to fill. Alexander Kukura Kravitz, please. Well, again, similarly, um, you know, this was a question that 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 uh, came up in a, in a similar fashion at the League of Women Voters uh, Forum last week as well. And to me, I've I've been very blessed um, by having an opportunity to work virtually with every single magisterial district judge in Luzerne County, as well as most, if not all, of the judges in the Court of Common Pleas, um, starting from a, from a law clerk as well. Um, based on that, it'd be hard for me. I'm sorry. Oh, 
I don't know why you would want to say that. Um, okay, I think we need to give me the phone. Please. Every magistrate, you don't have to be a judge. Thank you. Okay, I've got a, a turn, a, a Magistrate Kokora, if you could just kind of reiterate what you were saying before we were, um, sure. <laughs> we had that little. There were barking dogs, but it was something else. But go ahead. Sounds like my house, but I see Yeah, that's it. Sounds like my house as well. Um, <laughs> no, the truth is, it's hard for me to pinpoint one specific person because I see qualities in all of the judges that I've had the opportunity to work with. I've learned from every single one of them. Um, I've had the, the the real opportunity to to really grow um, in my current role as a magisterial district judge based upon their example. And, you know, the judges um, at the Court of Common Pleas have done a tremendous level of, uh, of, of work too in expanding all of our resources and our, our um, treatment courts too. And, and all of that has trickled down to the magisterial district judge and we really do work together. So um, I've just had the good fortune of having really good colleagues across the board and I would be uh, happy to, to, to really, um, you know, kind of model you know, my judicial temperament after, after, after any of them, um, balanced approach. Uh, Attorney Bobek. This is never just one. This is maybe the greatest thing about running as a judge and just even being a judge as 11 years. You have so many examples out there that you can just take their knowledge from and the way they approach it. We can take the temperament of Judge Burke, the even killed manner. And I've mentioned uh, before many times over uh, there's a judge in Lackawanna County that I find just to be one of the most fascinating writers in a civil case. He's written cases almost recently on Zoom and how Zoom cases can be tried and whether or not there's prejudice and, and family members attending a hearing. You can look at Judge Breyer. Judge Breyer is the hero of administrative law judges because he writes pragmatic step-by-step -step approaches to how the law should be taken. There's just so many different examples, and this is maybe the greatest thing. Ultimately, we can take all of this together. And I'll just come down to what my, frankly, the best judge ever learned truth, truthfully was my mother, who simply told me, Jim, listen, be a person who can have an opinion, but entertain another at the same time. That's been my goal my whole life, and it's still what I do as a judge right now. And so I'll take her over this one. Attorney Dennis. I, I do want to echo the sentiments of my colleagues here, and and we I did talk about Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Bader Ginsburg. I'm on the first round. We we spoke about this. Um, you know, Deborah Todd, who's uh, on our Pennsylvania Supreme Court. I feel like in our bar, I won't mention judges that I would have to be in front of. I don't want to be accused of sucking up to them, but I will say that Judge James Berry, who is retiring, having spent three years in juvenile court in front of him. He, that training, you know, I never ran for judge uh, up until now because I believe that all the training I experienced as a trial court attorney got me to where I am and watching Judge James Berry and the way that he spoke to families and to children in those unique circumstances was fantastic. Um, I admire any judge that does not need to use lengthy words or complicate things um, or make themselves uh, sound uh, need to make themselves be an heir or smart. I, I, I like judges that um, are regular people, just like me, uh, just like the way I've lived my life, who can uh, be plain language judges. And uh, I learned a lot from that. I learned a lot from watching judges that weren't like that. And I learned a lot from watching judges that did conduct their courtroom in that style. So, you know, I'm grateful for the opportunity you know, over two decades to really have been in front of a lot of judges and learned a lot of things about how the type of judge that I want to be now. Thank you. Stephanie Sullivan. And I'm just probably going to repeat everything everyone said. I, I have such respect for all of the judges from the magisterial district uh, judges, including Alex Kokora, Kravitz, and um, the common pleas judges. Um, I have seen that each judge um, has such a different personality and different perspective when it comes to handling their cases. Um, witnessing it firsthand as district attorney and working with these judges, um, it, it's been an honor to be able to work with them and improve the system with them. Um, I, but I, I, as I um, said in one of the interviews, 
the one of the people that sticks out, one of the judges that sticks out for me is Judge Burke. Uh, Judge Burke is someone that um, it, it, the first case I ever had, he was the judge I appeared in front of. And um, after I completed uh, our arguments, he called me in the back and we were talking and it, his his personality, his the way he treats people and the respect he gives to people, I, I, he is the kindest person I you could ever meet, and that is someone that I admire and someone I look up to. I look at him as um, he was the president judge during one of the most difficult times in Luzerne County's history, and he handled it with such grace. So I admire everything about him, but I don't want to say that I I, I don't admire all the other judges, because as as Laura stated, um, we still have to work with them every day. So um, I just want to make sure uh, that Judge Burke is someone that I I, I uh, state that he's someone I admire Fine. dearly. Thank you very much. Now we've kind of gone a little bit longer than anticipated, but because this is an important election and because it's a week away, we figured we would um, go as far as we possibly could in getting these wonderful candidates to answer the questions. So thank you, Magistrate Alexandra Kokora Kravitz, Attorney Jim Bobeck, Attorney Laura Dennis, former District Attorney and Attorney Stephanie Salavantis, State Representative and Attorney Tara Tuhill. I want to thank our attendees. And for those who tuned in and asked questions, we appreciate that. Don't forget to vote next week because this is a very consequential election. Uh, toward the end of the general election, two of these five people will become Luzerne County Common Pleas judges and they will serve for 10 years. And a lot could happen to you personally in 10 years and it will have an effect on your life. Now, the point can be made this year that our democracy has been tested, but the freedom to express ideas and opinions in a civil exchange with candidates like these gives us hope that the democracy that we have might have a chance to remain just what the founders intended it for it to be, a democracy bounded by the rule of law, a de democracy that is made indestructible. For the, w, for, w, for the NAACP branch number 2306 and our political action committee, I'm David Yankai. I hope you have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Good job, everyone. Good to see you. Thanks, Thanks guys. All. Thanks. Thanks to all of you, so you for participating. Thank, Thank you very much for having us. Yes.